I want to welcome everyone. We're launching today um, this um, series of webinars uh, that will happen during the next couple of months. Um, this is a partnership between JWell and uh, Learning at Scale at ICM. Um, I will say a couple of things before I introduce uh, Justin. Um, so we, um, I mean, in, in light of the current uh, situation and, and pandemic, um, in April we got to the point where out of the 1.7 billion learners, and that includes not only K-12, but also tertiary education, 91.3% of learners were out of school. Um, we recognize, um, you know, the, the sort of the response uh, uh, to connect the kids and to continue, uh, you know, in a way, uh, remote education. Uh, we recognize also that we're now moving to a more stable um, education that includes not only remote, but also uh, solutions that include blended learning. Um, we would like to promote research that help us understand um, what we're doing, but also take into account key findings and research that was previously, previously done um, in, in online learning that has happened for the most part uh, in higher education. So we'll be um, doing uh, a, uh, six uh, webinars in the next couple of months uh, until we launch the Learning at Scale conference. So we have more information about that. Um, I'd like to share here with everyone um, a link and it's maybe work in progress. We, we still have some of the, um, some of the future webinars um, listed there and information about registration, but um, uh, we have all of them confirmed for the next couple of months. Um, so our first speaker is Justin Reich. We happen to be uh, part of the steering committee for learning at scale and, and Justin will say more about his role. But Justin is an assistant professor uh, in comparative media studies and writing, and he's led um, a lot of the research um, uh, from learning at scale um, and around MOOCs and online learning, uh, both at MIT and Harvard. So um, I'll let him say more about his uh, role uh, within that and his current work at MIT. Uh, welcome, Justin. Thanks, Claudia, and thanks everyone for being here, for coming from uh, all over the world. It seems I saw the Bahamas in India and Massachusetts in California. Um, I want to acknowledge for the people in the United States that we're meeting during extraordinarily uh, difficult and sad times, um, and uh, and I want to take a moment to uh, to condemn anti-black racism, to grieve uh, for the victims of police violence. Um, the NAACP uh, has called today for uh, people to take a eight minute, 46 second moment of silence starting at 3.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, and so we're going to end uh, our session at a time. And if you want to um, uh, spend those eight minutes and 45 seconds with some other educators here with us. Um, we can do that. And then I expect a lot of people will also want to do that in their own time and in their own way. Um, and um, anti-Black racism and police violence are connected to outcomes uh, for learners in schools. Um, and what we're going to talk about and see is that the, the pandemic and school closures do not affect uh, all young people equally, um, and that the contours of inequality and, and structural injustice in the United States and around the world um, affect, uh, affect people's outcomes um, and the opportunities that young folks have. Um, uh, I think uh, we are in, as many folks have said, unprecedented times with these massive school closures. And we need to do two things simultaneously. We need to try to figure out as best we can what research tells us about, what, what, what suggestions and advice research gives us about how we might respond to these challenges as education systems. But we also have to have a tremendous amount of utility uh, humility that for the most part we have not done large numbers of randomized controlled trials of online learning or remote learning tools in the midst of pandemics. Um, things that work in normal times may work very differently in pandemic times. They might work very differently in the emergency remote closures this spring um, than they will in the fall. 
Um, and so that's the challenge uh, uh, that we face. In this webinar, we're going to mostly talk about the K-12 school system. In some of the weeks coming up, uh, we're going to have uh, lots of other different people. Um, I th one of the next one, we're going to have some colleagues from the University of Mercia talking about uh, how one Spanish university is adapting to changes. We're going to have uh, David Joyner, who's another great member of the Learning at Scale community, um, who's going to talk about all the great work that they've done with online learning at Georgia Tech. Um, and, and the whole series will kind of culminate um, in our uh, Learning at Scale conference this August. Uh, and the link is up there. And I hope many of you will join us, uh, join us there. Um, so my aim is to have us try to talk briefly about four kinds of things, uh, mostly focused on the United States, uh, where I've done most of the research, but hopefully relevant to other places. Um, what does research tell us that would give us some guidance around remote education and education during emergencies? Um, what was supposed to happen in schools? Kind of what was the plan when schools closed? What actually happened? And how might we start getting ready for the fall um, as uh, schools in the South and the West in the United States are uh, ending? And in the, in the Northeast and the Midwest, there's only a, a couple of weeks left. Um, so let me try to dive into those things. People should feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I'm, I have it open. I'm reasonably good at, uh, at multitasking uh, and, and thinking about what I want to say and responding to questions. So feel free to just jump in there as we go along. Um, some of our thinking on this topic is organized by a research study that we did recently um, called Remote Learning Guidance from State Education Agencies During the COVID-19 Pandemic, A First Look. This was something that we published at the beginning of April. On March 25th, um, we realized that a few states in the United States were starting to release guidance about what should happen. Um, and uh, I asked most of my research lab to kind of stop everything they were doing for a week and try to read up on what all 50 states are doing. Um, and we put that together uh, in, a, in a report, which is at the, this website, tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19, um, which I'm sure somebody can drop into the uh, uh, chat as well. Um, but uh, a bunch of our thinking around this has been framed by trying to figure out what did states recommend that people do? What did districts actually do? Um, and in that report, we started thinking about like, what would be some useful research for people to think about during this period? Um, and, and we came across sort of four things that we thought were, were pretty important. Um, what does relevant research say? So the first thing that we looked at um, is that the United States and other places around the world have run virtual schools for a number of years. Um, and one thing that we might default to, one question I might ask is, when, when virtual schools are set up not in the midst of a pandemic, what is it that people do? How are those schools organized? Um, and a crucial finding about these schools is that they're organized as coached homeschools. Um, there is very little evidence to suggest, there are very little reason to believe that especially our youngest students are capable of participating in online remote learning independently for extended periods of time. Um, you cannot put a seven-year-old in front of an iPad and say, you know, hold this iPad and learn from your teacher for the next three hours. Um, that's not how kids are wired. It's not what they have the um, developmental ability, the executive function to be able to do. And existing virtual schools recognize that. So what virtual schools typically do is they create bundles of asynchronous materials. They send those asynchronous materials at home. They, they are organized and usually in curriculum units of kind of a week or two week. They assume that people spend between two and, and five hours a day. And most importantly, they assume a especially for the youngest learners, a full-time caregiver who's capable of supporting that work. Um, in one survey, um, uh, uh, virtual school teachers report that they spend fewer than six hours a week um, in synchronous instruction, that really most of their time is spent individually reaching out to students and connecting with struggling students, especially those who are not raising their hand and asking for help, providing regular feedback, um, but they don't do a lot of synchronous instruction because, you know, and I think it's not exactly well established why, but it's hard to organize synchronous instruction um, across lots of places. Um, and uh, it's not clear how you do it effectively. Um, if you have a group of, of typically 26 students, how do you put 26 students in a Zoom room um, and have them participate in the kinds of meaningful learning experiences? Um, in my hometown of Arlington, Massachusetts, um, I, I heard a beautiful line from a school principal, an elementary school principal, who said something like, we're coming to realize that there are a thousand things that we do every day in schools that make learning work, and none of them work over Zoom. 
Um, there's all these sort of subtle maneuvers that we're using all day long, verbal and nonverbal, and we have not learned the equivalent body of things for synchronous learning. Now, one huge issue for equity is that there are many families that have someone who can devote two to five hours a day to helping families members learn, who have cousins or older siblings or other things like that. And there are many families that don't. Our most vulnerable families, um, families hit hardest by the pandemic, may be among those who have the fewest resources at home to be able to support home learning. But as challenging as that, as that is, there's sort of no way of getting around that as long as we're doing remote learning, the role of the home and family becomes more important. Um, I, I think a follow-up question that we'll need to be continually asking is what kinds of supports and resources are we going to be able to give to families to be able to support learning at home if that's where lots of the learning is going to take place. Um, a second body of research that I think is important just asks the question how effective is online learning generally? Um, and I want to argue that our thoughts on that question have changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. Um, so um, a sort of common belief in the past um, was that when people studied learning in different media environments, like learning in radio versus face-to-face, -face, learning through television versus face-to-face, -face, learning online versus face-to-face, -face, that you found no significant difference. Um, that basically it mattered a lot what kinds of pedagogical moves you used or what kind of instructional moves you used, but there's lots of studies that have done where the results of those studies suggest that there's no significant difference between online learning and face-to-face -face learning, or no significant difference between um, different forms of media. Um, this was a study that I'll get to in a little bit about online charter schools that has a pretty typical summary of this. In the history of education technology research, it's well established that technology as a delivery mechanism has no direct impact on student learning outcomes. Now, where much of this, and here's an older version of that in 1983. Um, in fact, it, you know, it seems reasonable to advise that we stop doing future media comparison research because we're just pretty sure that the medium doesn't really matter. Um, uh, I'll blast this. So here's one recent meta-analysis done by Barbara Means, which sort of summarizes some of that. When you look deeply into these studies, um, there's a few things about them that I think are noteworthy. Um, very few of them happen in K-12. Um, many of them happen in healthcare settings. Um, many of them have relatively few participants in them. Um, and um, in fact, almost all of them are such small studies that they're not capable of accounting um, for how people from different socioeconomic status backgrounds, from different racial backgrounds, from other different kinds of walks of life might experience online learning differently. So basically you could say that like between, you know, I don't know, 1990 um, and 2010, um, we did all of these studies, mostly in these kind of like hot house environments randomized control trials, um, which said that online learning and face-to-face -face learning had about the same results. Maybe blended learning was a little bit better. Um, what we did, especially between 2010 and 2020, was we unleashed online learning in the world. We had tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people starting to learn online. And then when we started doing observational studies during that period, we started coming up with different kinds of answers to the questions of how do things compare. Um, so here in figure one is one more recent study um, comparing people who attend virtual charter schools in the state of Indiana um, versus those who don't. And they have negative impacts on their test scores for years after enrolling in these online schools. Um, the one on the right is uh, from a study of for-profit online colleges where um, everyone experiences what what Ray Kaup in 2011 called an online penalty, um, that everybody typically had lower grade point averages in online classes and in face-to-face -face averages. Um, but these effects were worst from the students uh, who had the lowest prior GPA. Basically, those who came into online courses with low prior achievement, other studies have shown that ethnic racial minorities, people from lower socioeconomic status, um, everyone, almost everyone sort of experiences an online penalty. Um, but, uh, but those who are, mo you know, you could say the students who would, we would expect to be most negatively affected by a pandemic are the ones who in the best of times we would expect um, would be least well served by online learning. Um, Susan Dynarski in the New York Times summarized this new view saying online courses are harming the students who need the most help. Um, now, if you compare online learning to no learning, 
online learning is going to come out great. <laughs> online learning is a, is a great thing to do. There are lots of tools that can work really well. I think the thing that we really need to focus on from this last decade of research um, is that there's lots of evidence to suggest that like the kinds of students who would do fine anywhere, the kinds of kids who are going to learn, you know, if you just leave them in the library for the day, um, if you leave them in your home with an encyclopedia, like those kids will be fine online. Um, but the but the ones who have the hardest time finding success in our educational systems, the ones who are least capable of serving, are the ones who I think are most likely to struggle on average um, in online learning settings. That should really be shaping our thinking about how we do remote learning next year, how we allocate uh, resources to support, how we use our buildings. If we have limited residency in buildings, um, who gets to come to them? I think this this set of findings is important. And you know, I gave you that background a little bit because I still think. We, we fairly often hear um, that uh, you know there's no significant difference between online learning and face-to-face -face learning and I think there's a body of research from the last 10 years that questions that. Um, my good colleague uh, Jared Fries um, says the habit of self-direction plays a really important role. Um, I, th I th there's a lot of good evidence that shows that, that that some of the reason that when people struggle in online learning, um, one of the reasons why they struggle is that they lack, um, Renee Kizilchek is here, uh, self-regulated learning skills. Um, I do want to put a point on that there's a bunch of research about self-regulated learning that treats self-regulated learning as a character trait or a sort of like set of skills from an individual. But I also think that we should think of self-regulated learning as a set of conditions. Um, I can do self-regulated learning because I can close a door um, and have a quiet space to work in. Um, if I live in a, a space in which I have to share my room with lots of other people, um, it has nothing to do with my, with my traits or my skills or anything about me. I'm not in a condition where we can do self-regulated learning. Um, we did a study of, uh, of people who participated in the blended master's supply chain management program at MIT, and we have this sort of early evidence that there were more men that persisted in the program than women. Um, and one theory we have behind that is that men were more capable of shirking family responsibilities um, than women were. Um, that you that you could say something like you know uh, like the flip side of self-regulated you know one one self-regulated learning is making time and space to be focused on your learning. The flip side of making time and space for make for focusing on your individual learning is shirking your family responsibilities. Um, so thinking about those conditions, um, I think, is tremendously important. But Jared works for an organization called the the Summit Public Schools, which I think has done a great job, um, and we have a lot to learn from them about how we help students develop these habits of self-regulated learning. Um, and, uh, you know, Renee makes a terrific point um, that how online classes, you know, the, the fact that there are average differences between um, uh, online course performance and face-to-face -face course performance doesn't negate the fact that if you build these things more effectively or less effectively, that really matters. And obviously what has happened in the pandemic and what will continue to happen in the months ahead, um, it, you know, in the pandemic, our, our emergency remote learning were not effectively designed. They were designed with you know incredible uh, a plum and courage and rapidity by teachers all across the country um, and for whom we should be extraordinarily grateful um, but you know in a in a better world they would have had months to be able to plan for the pandemic people are going to have months to plan now um, but there's a lot of curriculum to plan for um, there's a there's a lot of work to be done between now and the fall um, some of that work is behind us, you know, some of that work, some of the things that schools can do is think about like, what are already designed online programs that I can purchase that are good um, and that are ready to go. Um, but, uh, um, but there's also lots of parts of our curriculum that we want to be tailored to our particular students in our particular context. So um, great, great points in these conversations. I do want to make a contrast um, between, you might say like online schooling and online learning. Um, because, you know, a sort of crazy thing about online learning um, is that when there's something that we're really passionate about, lots of people, including teens, are incredibly good at learning online learning. Like, you know, ask a kid who's really geeking out about Minecraft or Fortnite or makeup tutorials or, um, uh, 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 you know, arts and crafts projects or things like that, how much they learn online, and you'll get these incredibly sophisticated answers. People learn programming, they learn um, all kinds of things. Um, and I think it comes back to Jared's point that when, when, um, when intrinsic motivation is high, the internet is a great place for lots of kinds of people to learn. Um, when intrinsic motivation is low, online schooling is really hard. Um, uh, 
of there's a lot that we do in schools that for students feels like low intrinsic motivation. Um, one strategy that we might think about uh, in the in the fall ahead is to say, you know, what would it look like for the kinds of things that we're doing online to prioritize um, high intrinsic motivation kinds of activity? If we gave students more choice and more agency over what they learned, um, what would what would come of that? Um, Another, I think, really important thing for educators to keep in mind during this period, especially for those, you know, for any of you who are working in systems in which it feels like, you know, the last few months didn't go so great. Um, I, you know, and people who are hearing a lot about learning loss and those kinds of things, I, I want to remind folks that there's a bunch of research about education and emergencies that suggests that in emergencies, education can play a really important role in being a pr protective factor in helping support youth resilience. Um, we helped create schedules and routines. We provided intellectual stimulation. We connected youth with peers and trusted adults. Um, they may have learned less math in the last quarter than they would have in the last quarter of 2019. Um, but the imperfect work that we did as educators um, in all likelihood really mattered um, for, uh, for a number of students, for, for their well-being, for their health, for, for staying connected to their communities and to their schools. Um, all right, so like what was the game plan of what was supposed to happen um, over the last few months? We did some research on this. We looked at the guidance of all 50 states um, and we found that in the United States, there was, there was a lot of guidance, which I think was really exemplary. Um, there was a really strong focus on the physical and mental well-being of students. Um, you know, one small example of this is there were lots of states and school districts that recommended schedules for students. A lot of time those recommended schedules were shorter than a typical school day. They said, you know what, um, this week you should do about three hours a day of stuff. On many of those schedules, even though there was a reduced schedule, there was still a recommendation to do exercise and creative expression every day. Um, so even in the midst of really challenging times, you know, when, there, when we were cutting a lot of things from the curriculum, we said, let's prioritize the arts and let's prioritize physical education because that's what our kids need to be healthy right now. Um, in all of the rhetoric from states, there was a very strong focus of issues of equity. It was front and center. Actually, one of the things I've started to be a little bit concerned about is that the planning documents that I'm seeing for the fall, I don't think actually have the same level of rhetorical focus on equity um, as the emergency response documents from the spring. Um, so I encourage people, whatever it is you're reading, whatever it is you're learning um, about how to get ready for the fall, um, I think it matters to have uh, a rhetoric that says we're going to put our most vulnerable students, um, our students who, who we struggle to serve the best um, uh, in the front of our thinking. Um, there was lots of concern about providing digital and non-digital options for students. Um, you know, I think many of us are hoping that over the course of the next few months, um, the need for those non-digital options will lessen in lots of places because we've been working for three months to improve technology access, to improve broadband and computer access. Um, but there are still lots of places um, that didn't have uh, uh, computer access. And there are lots of places, especially in rural America, um, where we're not going to roll out broadband lines to every home in the next three months without a massive you know, surge of federal support. Um, so you know, the three big non-digital remote learning options um, were packets, um, mailing home uh, paper documents for people to work on, which had the advantage of being familiar and had the disadvantage of being really low motivation um, and, and offering very little feedback. Um, there are lots of states and municipalities that in various ways incorporated public broadcasting. Um, and I think schools should continue to think about how they incorporate public broadcasting in the fall. We are in a golden age of children's television right now. Um, the, you know, the stuff that's being made available on the PBS Kids app uh, uh, through television programming is really pretty incredible. Um, you know, there, I mean, there was incredible stuff when I was a kid, but just in terms of the hours a day, which are now available at different grade spans in different subject areas, um, I think uh, folks that, that are only going to be able to have kids come into school for a limited amount of time each week should be continued to think about, especially for sort of K through six, the role that television can play. Um, and then I'll get to this more, but but lots of thoughts of like what kind of learning can happen at home. Um, and then there was a big sort of uh, rhetorical split in the in the state guidance about what should we do with our time during the pandemic. Um, and some states said, let's try to keep teaching 
um, the material that is aligned with our standards. Um, a term that got used a lot that will probably continue to be used in the year ahead was this idea of power standards. Let's identify the standards that we teach in the last quarter of the year that are most important for students continued learning um, and let's really focus uh, curriculum guidance on that. There was an alternative view which said the things that we do at school are going to be really hard to do at home. Um, and it doesn't make sense to try to fit the square peg of school into the round hole of home. So let's try to support the kind of learning at home that happens best at home. Um, uh, this was some guidance that came out from some New Mexico science educators. Um, you know, that said along the lines of, yeah, rather than trying to recreate school, um, let's think about the kinds of learning experiences that can happen at home that connect to students', students lives, their interests and identities. Um, uh, there was a, a a reporter that interviewed me from the North Slope of Alaska um, who said, look, in, in the North Slope of Alaska where connectivity is terrible, we're not going to do school at home. But this is a great time um, to emphasize a Nupiaq culture. This is a great time for people to learn how to um, sew and bead and cook and fix snow machines. Um, let's do the kinds of things that we can do really effectively at home. And then when we get more access to school, we'll go back and teach school. Um, I think that will be a great question for us to continue to ask next year. Um, and there'll probably be different answers in different places, but what is, um, what is the best use of our online learning time? What is the best use of our limited residency building time? And what kind of learning can happen at home? Uh, you know, and a huge challenge that we have in the United States is that we have 130,000 schools that are organized in 13,000 school districts. And the kinds of things that people do in, in, in the North Slope of Alaska are probably not what they should do in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and so people are gonna have to take these principles and, and sort of reinvent them to some extent in their local contexts. Um, Another way to sort of frame this, I was interviewing a math teacher um, and I said, you know what, we, what we really have to do during remote learning is focus on the most important things. And he said, mm, I think that's half right. I think we also need to focus on the, the most achievable things. Um, as a math, this person was a fourth grade teacher, a sixth grade teacher, an eighth grade teacher. I think he, had, I think he was a third grade teacher too. He had, he had four preps. Um, and he said, I'm not just thinking about what the most important thing is for my students to advance in math. I'm thinking like, what can I effectively teach online? Um, and so you end up with this kind of trade-off where things that are important, things that are achievable, we should definitely focus on those kinds of things. Things that are less important, things that are less, you know, things that are important but really not achievable, we may still want to um, stay away from. So what actually, so that was sort of what the plan was going to look like, um, and they were different in different places. What has actually happened over the last three months? Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that we don't totally understand what has happened over the course of the last three months. Um, that you can read policy documents from states, you can read policy documents from districts, you can read reports on the percentage of attendance and those kinds of things, and it will not tell you what actually happened in the relationships between um, teachers and students in schools. Um, uh, we know for sure um, that some teachers did the kinds of things that their schools asked them to do. Some teachers did totally different things. Um, uh, and some of those things work more effectively and some work less effectively. Not only that, but you know, one line that I've had is that everyone is having a different pandemic. Um, there were lots of students who th have thrived during the period of remote learning. Like if you find school socially stressful, um, if you uh, find school to be a, a place where you experience racism and bigotry, um, being at home in the loving arms of your family could be great. Um, actually, my daughter was just assigned by her third grade teacher to write an opinion essay, and her opinion essay was uh, why uh, learning at home is better than learning at school. Um, and so she uh, uh, you know, effectively argued against returning. Um, my, uh, my first grade daughter has not participated in remote learning at all. She gets no psychic reward whatsoever um, from participating in Zoom meetings or doing the online packets they send home and things like that. Um, but uh, that's a great line, Sylvia. We're all at the same sea, but we're not in the same kind of boat. We're not steering in the same direction. Um, but by all accounts, um, the, it has been much harder to provision online and remote learning to students in low-income neighborhoods, uh, to students in schools that have historically been plagued by racism, bigotry, um, to uh, places with weak technology connections. Um, and, uh, and, and that, I think, in all of our planning, you know, we need to start with the question of, you know, how are we going to serve our most vulnerable learners as we start coming back? Um, there's been lots of these kinds of surveys around. Um, you know, this is an interesting one from AI, 
AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, you know, who uh, they sort of highlighted that uh, um, children were doing, parents reported children doing less schoolwork and parents reported children learning less. And they sort of circled those, which are the largest. But actually, if you add the more schoolwork and about the same amount of schoolwork, you know, it's 60% or so of folks who said they're doing uh, about the same or more um, during now. And again, about 60% of folks, 50% of folks who are saying they're uh, um, learning about the same or more. Um, I would be, you know, I think when people hear these questions, they intuitively answer them around, um, well, are they learning academic subject material? But I think an important thing to keep in mind is that our students are always learning. If the thing that we really measured in schools were how much do students learn about technology and communication, there has been tremendous learning around that over the last three months by adults and by kids. Um, I think many, many students have learned much more through, you know, the force of necessity about independent learning, about self-regulated learning. I think um, there's some important learning loss to be measured in the months ahead, but I think it's also really important to celebrate the incredible learning that has happened and the extraordinary resilience that youth have shown over this period. Um, I think schools that bring a sort of asset framing um, to, their, to the rebooting of the, of the fall will be in better position than, than schools that sort of exclusively focus um, on, on loss and remediation. Um, a second study that we're in the midst of doing right now, which anybody who wants to can contribute to, it's called the Emergency Remote Instruction Study, um, and it's hosted at the OSF, and maybe Megan, I think if she's here, can, if, if we can find the link for it, we can put it in there. Um, but we've started, we've done interviews with about 30 teachers from across the country about their experience, and we've taken their transcripts, and we've made the de-identified transcripts um, openly available on this website. So right now, you can go and you can read 14 interviews with teachers um, in depth about their experiences, and if there are other folks who are out there who are interviewing teachers, um, we would encourage you to, to get permission to contribute to, um, to this data set. We'd welcome anybody who wants to participate with us. Um, one of our sort of early intuitions, I wouldn't call it a finding yet because we're still looking at it, um, is that we're hearing from a number of folks that um, that emergency remote instruction got worse over this period, um, that teachers feel like uh, we sent out a survey in March which said, um, rate, your, rate how emergency going is on a scale of one to 10. Um, and then we talked to a lot of people in April and May and we asked them that question again um, and they said that things had gotten worse. Um, I think for a variety of reasons. Um, some of those reasons may have been that people got fatigued. Um, some of those reasons may have been um, that I think a lot of states made the really thoughtful decision to say, um, we're not going to assign grades, everyone's going to be promoted. Um, and a lot of students looked at that and said, oh, I don't have to do stuff then. Um, this one teacher we talked to um, was, a, was a teacher who taught you know, various kinds of uh, special classes. She taught a, um, a computing forensics class and some other kinds of things like that. Um, and one of the things that she told us is that, uh, A, the, you know, that she had started using some technology tools, and then the district told her to use different technology tools, and then some other uh, classes, you know, the core curriculum classes got online, and people focus, focus more on math and English language arts than on her classes. This is just one story from one teacher. Um, uh, Renee brings up the idea that there may be some kind of novelty effect here, um, that uh, you know, it's sort of exciting to like hop on Zoom and figure out how to make all this work. Um, and, then, uh, and then others, Armando suggests that there's sort of unrealistic expectations, everyone getting kind of tired at the end of the year. Um, I do think this is something that we really need to think about as we start planning for the fall, um, that we might see similar things happen again, that there's sort of like a rah-rah surge of come back together in late August and September, and then we might find that people get pretty tired again um, in October and November, and thinking about what is gonna be the sort of new surge that sustains people during that period of time, how are we gonna accommodate that, how are we gonna give people different kinds of breaks, um, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you know, and Karen says that, that she's been supporting 25 schools um, and, uh, you know, hoping that uh, that teachers feel like things are getting better. And that certainly is very likely to be the case in some places um, that as they as people get more support. And Jared brings up the great point that uh, um, that teachers are always getting kind of tired at, at this point of year. And we could expect that, too, as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of the things about that we often do in research is that we try to compare a thing that we're seeing or a new thing that we're trying against some kind of business as usual. Um, there's no business as usual during a pandemic. It's really hard for us to think about like, what is the anchor point that we should be comparing um, new efforts against? Uh, but I think this notion of, of fatigue is something to be attentive to. Um, 
I, you know, um, we do a lot of teacher education in our lab. And one joke that we make a whole lot is that when things get tough when you're teaching, the correct answer for a really hard situation is almost always something that you should have done three months ago. Um, that when you get into a sticky spot, it's because sort of things weren't set up in the right way. Um, and I actually think there's a lot of evidence for that here. We've been, we've been trying to figure out like, what are the protective factors for schools um, that are being more successful during this period? And certainly things are easier in affluent, connected, well-resourced neighborhoods. Um, and one of the things that we need to advocate for probably more citizens than as educators um, is how are we gonna make sure that um, less affluent, less connected, less well resourced neighborhoods get those resources. Um, in particular, as uh, you know, as we face in the United States, tremendous budget cuts, especially for state education budgets. Um, if those, you know, are, go across the board, um, they're going to disproportionately affect low income districts much more than more affluent districts, and we need to be thoughtful about that. Um, but the places that seem to, to be more successful during this period um, are those that had strong school culture and strong school leadership that had existing, you know, coincidental commitments to technology and then had a strong school wide pedagogical model. Um, and many of those, you know, those pedagogical models can be really quite different. Um, I think there are some places that have, you know, largely bought um, kind of canned curriculum, uh, online curriculum online, um, and have been using it and have been using it really effectively. There were other places that did, that had a really strong culture of bespoke um, project based learning. Um, and, uh, um, and they're and they've made that project based learning work as well. Um, I think, you know, a distinguishing feature of the schools that have navigated this most successfully is that they sort of have they have a pedagogical vision that's shared across the faculty and they're able to work together um, to to build whatever their curriculum response is going to be together so that it doesn't sort of fall on every teacher trying to figure things out uh, on their own. So knowing some of those things, like what can we do to get ready for a fall, especially for a fall when there's a great deal of uncertainty, uh, particularly around the most important question, like how much are we going to be able to use our school buildings? Um, and we just don't have a clear answer to that and, and probably won't right up until August. And we're still not going to know things like how bad is the second wave of flu season going to be in October? Um, all of these things are unknown. So here are four pieces of advice that I have for you in these last five minutes. Um, for planning for that. And the first piece of advice is to involve students. Um, these are some notes that we took from a 15 person uh, charrette with middle school students in the Boston Public Schools. Um, and we asked them two questions. What are the best experiences for you at school? What do you care most about? And then start giving us your ideas about how we can make those things happen with low residency use of buildings and remotely. There is, ex you know, adults know all kinds of things about teaching and learning in schools, but there is exactly one generation of Americans that has experienced remote learning during a pandemic. And it's the kids who are sitting in our schools right now. And we need to, we need to talk with them and we need to ask them what's working because they're the only ones who know and they are the only ones who can help us make this work. Um, you know, I think, I think many of the schools and just, you know, it's totally normal for teachers, for adults, for faculty, for school leaders to say, look, school is our thing and we got this and we're going to take care of it. But schools are going to be stretched in unbelievable ways next year. And we just need to recruit our students and families as partners in ways that we never have before. So a thing, even if you have no idea what you think you should be doing next year, you can start by asking your students, what's most important to school with you? What do you want? Um, and what ideas do you have to build those things? And, you know, if your students are any like the 15 that they talk to, the first thing they're going to say is that the relationships matter to them enormously. And building and maintaining those relationships online is really hard. Um, and so schools should think about um, how they're going to go about doing um, that relationship building in the fall. We did similar kinds of things uh, with families and teachers and with communities. And I would encourage you to do that. We're trying to publish in the next month, if we can get around to it, um, some uh, design protocols that we've developed for sort of online design charrette routines that you can use um, with multi-stakeholder groups on Zoom. I mean, lots of people have probably participated in these kinds of meetings with post-it notes and poster boards and markers that you have, you know, really closely together in person. Um, what does that look like online? Um, but again, I think um, involving lots of different stakeholders early on in the process, um, what's important to you, um, what can we do less of? Um, what can we focus on? One of the things that I'm starting to see are a wide variety of checklists. 
Um, I think if you're in a school leadership position and you're trying to think about how am I going to plan for all the eventualities, there are some organizations are out there that are making, you know, 70, 80 page documents to say, here are all the kinds of things that you're going to need to play. Like, here's what the buses are going to have to look like and the bathrooms are going to have to look like and the school periods and your IEP plans and things like that. Um, and I would encourage folks to um, borrow from these checklists um, and, you know, find one that you think adheres to the values of your community and use that in your internal leadership team to, to build off of. This one from Transcend I liked, and it was in a Google Doc, so you can copy it and edit it and add your own pieces to it. But I think one risk of the checklists is that you are not going to be able to communicate um, 87 different points to your families in the beginning of November, uh, in the beginning of September. You're not going to be able to sort of come back to school and say, um, all right, we've made 142 changes. Here's, you know, a website that details all of them because no one's going to read and listen to that. So I also think schools need to start thinking about like, what are going to be our big tentpole ideas for next year? Um, what are going to be the one or two or three most important things that we want to communicate to our students and families that we want to kind of design and organize around? Um, here are three of the ones that we encountered. Um, we had one middle school teacher who said, um, our, our students and families are totally confused by all the communications they're getting from teachers and families. And so next year, everything should be organized around advisories. Every eight or nine kids should have one adult who takes care of them um, and who focuses that communication and who helps keep an eye on them. And the teachers should do it and the principals should do it and the librarians and the nurses, everyone should get nine or 10 kids. And that's who we're gonna get together. I don't know if that's the right solution for every idea, but that's what I mean by a kind of tentpole idea. You can imagine organizing a whole year of this chaotic remote blended learning around that principle. The thing that's gonna make it work is that um, the 10 of you are gonna be in a little camping team with this one teacher and you're going to make it work. We talked to another school assistant principal who said, when students get to use our buildings and our building time is going to be gold, we want at least half of that time to be for electives and extracurriculars. We want half of your time in buildings spent on the things that kids love most about school. Again, I think that's a kind of tentpole idea, a tentpole value. Um, a third one that I got excited about was this idea of we, we need to somehow network our parents together in ways that we have never done before. That might look like groups of three or four parents in an apartment building or in a neighborhood, um, uh, networking with each other, taking turns, supporting remote learning, um, forming play groups so that even if there's another um, kind of return of the pandemic, uh, uh, we can focus on that. So those tentpole ideas are, I hope, are ones that you're thinking about because you're not going to be able to communicate 148 things to your families. Um, but if you can find one or two or three big ideas that say like, look, this is what we're really trying to do together next year. And all of the other smaller decisions that we make feed into this key value, this key principle. Um, I think you'll be able to get more buy-in and support with that. Um, it's 3.45. Um, it's been really fun to read your questions. I'm uh, at BJFR on Twitter. I'd love to keep the conversation uh, uh, going with you and advancing. Um, there are other things uh, that you can find at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19 on the Teach Lab podcast. Um, and, uh, and with that, I would invite uh, anybody who wants to spend uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds um, grieving uh, for uh, for victims of police brutality in the United States and grieving for uh, for the, the risks that protesters are taking and the challenges our system faced to, to join me or others. Um, the slides will be distributed uh, to everybody who signed up um, and uh, really, really grateful to you all for being here and for, for all the work that you do. Thank you so much, Justin. I think we're gonna stay here for those who would like to stay. Um,
Hey, Justin. Um, I think we still have 45 people uh, who stayed with us. Um, I, I mean, if, if you still have the time, we have five minutes, uh, answer some questions. Um, sure. I'd love to hear more about, um, you know, recommendations for research. For me, like evidence and uh, agile sharing of this kinds of results um, are great because we're not going to have time, like you said, to do big RCTs uh, to study impact, but it's really agile and how do we um, approach that? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, our, uh, our bet is uh, very similar. You know, the, the things that we think are important are um, the things that we've chosen to work on. Um, so one of those things is what actually happened um, in classrooms during emergency remote closures and how did teachers and students experience that? Um, and that I think is something that everyone can, you know, I mean, we'll do it as best we can with, you know, sort of rigorous qualitative methods training, all that, but all of us can in our communities ask the question like, do we really know what, what happened, what the variation looked like? Um, I think local communities can start asking the questions like what worked, you know, what felt like it was really successful here um, that we could teach other people and borrow from. So, um, and, and that I think connects to our second project uh, after interviewing teachers of trying to figure out uh, um, what, how do we, how do we design processes that let people be more involved. Um, and, uh, um, but uh, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to try to estimate like what learning uh, didn't happen that does happen in a typical school year. That seems interesting. Um, uh, there are probably some folks out there who can, um, you know, answer some questions about like, you know, here's a big one. Many education technology products are really designed to be used in some kind of blended session setting. There's like very few things that we really say to people, especially in K-12, just go ahead and try to do this online. Um, how well did those things work? Um, and, uh, you know, were there any of them that seemed particularly effective when operated sort of totally at a distance would be another interesting one to, um, uh, to investigate. Um, those would be, you know, but I, and then, I mean, I think the, the two other things that can happen are, uh, you know, I think school, as much as possible, school districts um, and representatives of school districts, you know, the Council for Chief State School Officers, other kinds of folks should be loud at saying, like, what are your questions? Um, there are a whole, you know, there are a whole bunch of education researchers across the country and across the world who had some kind of plans um, for this spring and this summer that were, um, you know, doing partnership driven research that were sort of skunked by this. And they've got some free time. Um, so I think if, if we knew what it is that we wanted to tackle, we could, uh, uh, what that people wanted us to tackle, we could direct our efforts in those places yeah i mean i think one of the um, um i mean uh, selfish uh promotion of learning at scale is one of the um places where people can also share um early projects or um you know research that is starting um but are there other um, recommendations. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's a great thing to point people to. So for those who are on as, as researchers or educators, learning at scale is hosting um, a new kind of late breaking call for papers um, that's focused on um, uh, uh, sort of uh, COVID-19 case studies, just people um, delivering short papers about what happened. So you have to scroll down a little bit or do a search on the page for COVID-19, but on the link there, you can find some of those things. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, and I hope people will join us for the conference on uh, August uh, 12th to 14th to be able to um, to listen to what people have learned and to share some of those ideas. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think any any of these mechanisms for sort of uh, uh, you know we need to balance kind of rapid data sharing with also the constant humility that that research that is done quickly can't always be done very well. Um, you know, one of the things I'm seeing right now is there are lots and lots of surveys. Um, that are getting done and lots of them point in the same direction. Um, but, you know, really good surveys are also validated by, you know, qualitative interview research by other kinds of investigations. Um, so it'll take us some time to, to know whether or not these things are working. Good. Well, grateful to folks who, uh, who 
joined us here. Um, Want to uh, let people go as it turns to four o'clock for those of us you who stayed and, and participated in um, a time of silence with us. It certainly is just uh, agonizing to you know nine minutes sitting in a chair is a long time. Nine minutes with a police officer's knee on the back of your neck is unconscionable, um, and uh, and doing that certainly makes you think about that. But um, you know I I am very grateful I get to wake up every morning and work with uh, teachers and educators and folks in all kinds of places who are working towards a, a more just future and hopefully we can redouble our efforts towards that. Um, you know the the year ahead is going to I think be really hard for educators um, because we're not we're not going to be as successful as we are in a normal year as we want to be. Um, but I also think everything that's going on um, really uh, speaks to the incredibly important work we do. So for all of you who are taking a break from your remote learning or from the start of your summer vacation to, to join us, I really am grateful for um, the work that teachers and school leaders do and grateful for the chance to support it. So thank you.